Hello, and welcome to Stories from the Wire, the App Meta podcast. We talk to the experts about the most pressing app and network issues facing the enterprise today and tell you how to work smarter, not harder, to speed up resolution. I'm Paul Davenport, App Meta's resident tech journalist, and each week we're going to dive into a specific issue that we've helped an IT team tackle. Today and over the coming weeks, we're diving right on into work from home, perhaps the hot topic of the past year, how enterprises are optimizing their infrastructure to support a work from anywhere future. This week, we want to zero in on the contact center. We've all likely had consumer side experiences with poor contact center performance, but according to market intelligence from GEP, contact centers witnessed an increase of 300% more calls than usual during the early stages of the pandemic. And research shows that the sudden increase in call volumes had a significant impact in contact center KPIs, as the average handle time increased from an average of three to six minutes for most contact centers to closer to 10 plus minutes at the pandemic start. But those who worked in contact centers were, in many cases, logging on to the job remotely for the first time. So we've invited technical account manager and at this rate, contact center guru Joseph Oaks onto the podcast to talk about some of the challenges contact centers and agents faced over the course of the pandemic, how Joe and the team helped customers navigate some of their hairier scenarios, and what lessons IT leaders can take with them as they future-proof their call centers for whatever the future of work looks like. With that, welcome to the podcast, Joe. How's it going? Doing well, Paul. Excited to be here. Awesome. And as always, Alec, thanks for joining. Hey, Paul. All right. So before we dive in, I want to highlight a pre-pandemic stat from IDG that showed that as of 2019, 62.4% of global enterprises had cloud-based or virtual contact centers to facilitate their customer service and outreach operations. So Even though it sounds like contact centers were early cloud adopters, i.e. Genesis and Poly, why was work from home such a tricky proposition for contact center agents as the pandemic kicked off? I think it comes down to primarily the way that, the way agents were accessing the software. Uh, We went from a primarily brick and mortar approach where your agents were in a, a business owned and operated and managed call center location to working from home. And with all of the variants that we see in in home networks, that's going to have a negative impact. One of the recent examples that comes to mind, we had a we had a customer that operates a, a large call center business for multiple other companies, and they had a scenario in which agents are moving from a business level commercial grade circuit to what's available in rural APAC, which typically is your typical bonded T or even basic T, in some cases, DSL service. And so that throws a wrench in the system when you're talking about a service like contact center as a service platforms, which require a certain level of performance from the network. You can't tolerate high levels of jitter. You can't tolerate a low levels bandwidth. Um, and so that really feeds into why work from home was such a challenge for these these providers and for these organizations. Yeah, and I feel like from the customer standpoint, as you know myself, my impression of what the call center needs is really just a phone line, but it's probably much more than that. You've got the entire integrated workflow of what uh, accounts they need to access, all the, the data centers that they need to connect to to get the data uh, for me, and then they have to do the call. So it's an interesting point. It's also interesting too, you've, you've kind of sparked another idea in, in my head, which again, same type of scenario. It's not just the contact center software, it's all of the other tools that you have to leverage as well. And making sure that agents can access all of those resources. And I don't wanna harp specifically on APAC because that's obviously an easy example, but it can happen in the US or Europe, it, really anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter what your network performance looks like for one application if you're also running multiple others and throw additional wrenches in the system when you're starting to talk about latency inducing services like VDIs or VPNs, there is no way that you're going to get away with standard performance when you start layering all of these things together. And that also poses a challenge because now it's not just the the voice call quality or the, the contact center software quality, it's also what about all of the other services? Is, is it gonna take me twice as long to run this report that I need to be able to provide the feedback to the customer? Or am I gonna be stuck waiting for a ticket to load and, uh, and be entered into our ticketing system? And so I have to then keep the, you know, the customer on the phone for an extra minute while I wait for that spinning wheel to go away. 
those are also factors. Yeah, I'm in the process of moving right now. And one of the things that I've had to deal with is obviously utility companies and the experience from, you know, a specific gas company that I work with today took 45 minutes on the call for 10 minutes and then on hold for 30 while this person waited for their system to load and waited for the account to settle and figure out what the you know end of the service billing would be, I got on the phone with uh, an electric company and it took 10 minutes. And most of that was me just hitting the buttons to get to the right person. Uh, it was immediate. And I was so surprised, but I think that's part of it is if the system behind the call, which is just the customer facing side, if that system is quick and resilient, then the customer experience, no matter what, is going to be better. You could have a surly person on the phone, but as long as that system is quick, I'm going to be a happy customer. You, you call out a really interesting point there too. It's not just the experience from the agent perspective. It's also the experience from the, the customer's perspective. And I think a key component of that is when we talk about call quality. Calls are bi-directional in nature. You don't have one-way calls. You have systems which are still bi-directional. To your point, Alec, you know the the system that you talked about, where you're you're dialing numbers to get to the right person. That's still a bi-directional interface, and it's not just important to understand what your agent's performance looks like from an organizational perspective, so you can make sure that their end is is good. It's also about being able to exonerate your employees and your agents when a call goes bad if it is not their fault. Because the other thing that we have to consider is it's it's just as much a factor of the what the consumer is calling in from. If I'm calling in from my home on my cell phone, I live in a, a, a relatively suburban area, we don't have great cell phone coverage, especially not in my basement office. And so the call quality is gonna be different versus if I use my landline phone that's connected to my home internet. Very, very different experience. But again, that's something that will be held against in most cases, the, the call center agent if that call goes sour, even though it may not have been their fault. So having that visibility to be able to prove that the agent network is good is really it is just as important as understanding what that performance looks like to be able to say, yes, you can effectively work from home. Gotcha. Okay. So I think we touched on a few things here. I just want to do a quick recap. So it sounds like there's regionality at play. What providers are actually available in a given area where these contact center agents are being supported? And those obviously are going to have a trickle down effect on how apps are getting delivered, but the apps themselves and the other tools that they're using. There's the usual corporate voice and video solutions, your Genesis solutions, your poly tools, all of that. But then there's also how that impacts your customers. They're expecting consistency in performance no matter what. How do IT teams make sure that there's just consistency in how they're actually impacting customer service? Since that's really what the contact center is all about. One of the key ways of providing and, and ensuring that minimal variability, Paul, to your point, comes in having monitoring capabilities to help us understand the difference in the performance of the user on site versus at home. Um, what we're seeing is a lot of customers are, are looking at expanding from our traditional deployment methodology, which was primarily on premise with you know small focus on the per user or per agent uh, perspective to a combination really of both and, and building out a, a really solid per user state meaning deploying to multiple workstations, deploying to high priority users, or um, in some cases deploying to all users, um, while also having the backbone monitoring in place at the office locations or at the data centers. And the reason being, when you can see things like voice loss and you can see things like voice jitter and you can compare the performance of specific carriers or you can compare the performance of wireless networks even to go deep as we want, that's really how you're going to be able to tell. So for example, you know, we know that if you go into an office building and you're sitting in a, a large open space, there's been some thought put in by IT about placement of things like access points and wireless coverage. We know that the, the devices, the access points themselves are going to be a set level higher than what we might individually get in our home networks. Um, and for those of us who aren't savvy, it, it may even be a, a lack of understanding in how far is wireless really effective, right? And it's something as basic as that, though, that's going to 
change how a user experiences the network. If I'm in the office and I'm on a commercial grade access point, which can support 40 or 50 clients versus I'm at home on my home ISP router with my two kids, you know, my wife and everybody else around me making their own calls, being on Zoom meetings, watching videos, all of these things, there's gonna be a significant difference in the performance. So having a tool that can monitor for that and, and give you comparative data, you know, for example, at Meta's new wireless metrics capabilities allow us to see specifically how my device, my MacBook at my house is performing when connected to my network. And I can compare, for example, the difference between connecting to my home router versus the, I'll call them semi-commercial grade access points that I've installed throughout my house. Um, and we can very clearly see, hey, there's a distinct difference between if I'm connecting on one edge of the house to that router versus those access points, just like I would be able to see a distinct difference connecting to my home router versus connecting to that, that commercial grade equipment in my office. So having the ability to monitor that is certainly one of the ways that we uh, make sure to minimize variability. The second piece, though, really ties into making sure that everybody involved is fully aware of the requirements. And I, I say that not as a, you know, you have to meet these requirements or else, but what I mean is have SLAs defined not only for your business applications and services, but your users' applications and services. And, and not necessarily to the extent of, oh, we expect these to have 99% uptime. I'm talking more from the perspective of go in to conversations with your agents and your hiring teams and say, listen, we know that we have a need to hire, for example, in a certain region. Let's say, you know, we're, we're looking at rural Kansas in the US, just as an example. Um, and I know that maybe there might not be the same availability of high speed network or internet access as there is in Boston, right? In Boston or even north of Boston. I mean, I'm, I'm here in New Hampshire and I'm sitting at a gig speed network. In, in you know, rural Kansas, I might be operating on a farm where the only thing that I can get is DSL. And that means that my maximum connection speed is six megabits. So being able to go into a conversation to say, listen, we want to be diverse. We want to have a strong employee base, but we also have to be cognizant of what's available in each of these areas and be able to then tie that back. We don't want to say, hey, put this limit in place just for the sake of having a limit. We also want to be able to monitor and, and make sure that that this limit does have a negative impact because you could have a user with a, a slower connection speed that has a flawless connection um, versus a user like me with a gig speed and I'm having all sorts of issues, you know, so it, it really varies, but it, it, it all kind of ties back to the monitoring and, and having a solution in place that's going to provide you that visibility. So you're not saying that every user should have a gig speed connection at their house necessarily, but there is some education probably that should be given broadly to make sure that we're at least all on the same page in terms of what connections we have and the efficacy of those solutions. Yeah, and I think that there could also be more effort engaged in just educating users in what does bandwidth actually mean, right? Because I think as as technically savvy individuals, we all think of bandwidth as being a real core competency. You have to have high speed bandwidth, you know, and, and even I, I fall victim to this myself. You know, I saw, hey, there's a gig speed network available here. I want it. Do I really need it? No, but I want it so that I have that coverage. So I think that there's an opportunity to educate more broadly about what are the things that really matter. And I think what we'll find is if you ask that question, most people are going to say, oh, bandwidth is, is the most important, but it's not. There are other factors. There's things like density of devices. If I have 15 devices all sitting in the same room in my house, my wireless network at home, my residential grade equipment is not going to be able to support that as well as you know the same scenario in an office space. And so there has to be a wider level of education out there to say it's not just about establishing SLA, it's, it's understanding what feeds into the SLA that's important. And, and it's not always just going to be bandwidth. So, you know, it's, it's kind of it's a fun it's a fun line to walk. Right. It's, it's kind of fun because you get to learn about things that you might otherwise not learn about. And as a you know, as an IT professional, it gives you the opportunity to educate, educate others on things that you're you're very well aware of. Yeah, and something I've mentioned on this podcast before is using policy as education for users and mandating, potentially, we've got customers mandating wired versus wireless connections and, and using that as an opportunity to educate of why 
a wired connection might be better. And it might not be that you have to spend IT resources or time to redesign user networks, but at least showing them that, hey, wireless is not equal to wired. And especially in home connections uh, with you know brick chimneys and, and things like that, you, you've got a lot of different things going on in the home, especially if you have uh, e-learning or kids around. And I think that's one thing that you can do from the IT perspective is create some policies around that. And I think talking to the hiring team is a great example of the time where IT can actually use that as a moment to teach everyone else. As all of these enterprises start hiring more and more remote employees, it's going to be you know, more and more necessary. Awesome. All right. So, Alec, you mentioned wired versus wireless, for instance, as a personal SLA given out to employees. Um, are there any other examples that we've seen from customers? Um, maybe things like making sure you're up to date on the latest versions of soft. Yeah, no, I, I think that there's a couple of examples there, um, you know, in, in terms of the first IE that you gave, which was related to, you know, software versioning. Um, we recently had a, a customer, again, large contact, contact center manager. Um, for other large customers, and specifically, one of uh, one of the groups of agents supporting a specific client was having some issues where users were just having really bad call audio. And when we took a look at the data from Upneta, what we saw was there wasn't really anything super concerning. So the data was saying capacity looks good. We're we're not anywhere near the minimum requirements. There was no loss and even jitter looked decent. Mind you, it was within industry standards. So it was around 30 milliseconds of voice jitter that we were experiencing on the path, which in theory is again, a, a you know, tolerable range for most uh, VoIP services. Um, yet inexplicably, there were still all of these issues. And what we were noticing is that it was very specific and continuous for a certain subset of users. And it was all of those users that were seeing that that 30 milliseconds or, or right around there of jitter. And so one of the things that we ended up doing was doing some research into the service that that customer was using. And it just happened that most of the agents that were experiencing the issues were on in, in a slightly older version, you know, one, one major version behind um, the latest and greatest. And after doing some digging, what we found was that that version had a known bug or known incident where it said, hey, if, if you're experiencing near, you know, 30 milliseconds of jitter, agents are probably not going to have the best experience. That's not recommended. We recommend a, a higher tolerance or a higher, or I should say a lower level of jitter as a, as a requirement here. And after that research, we fed that back to the customer. Um, the customer did some testing and found out that the newest version of that software ended up resolving the issue. And so even though we didn't you know, there was nothing for us to isolate. There was there was really no network issue. We were able to isolate and identify that the path forward in this scenario was an app upgrade. So it's again, it's not always about the network. It, sometimes it's about what the network can tell you, but you have to take that information and then feed it back and figure out, okay, if the network isn't the problem, where are my uh, other points of failure? So, I mean, that's, I think that's one really good example. Um, another is not really business related, but I think it, it kind of hits home on the point of the wired versus wireless conversation. I was recently talking to my mother-in-law and uh, around their house, they've deployed a number of uh, cameras um, and they're, they're all wireless cameras. Now, you know, my in-laws are, are not super technical people and they just have their Comcast router sitting at their house uh, in her basement office and she works from home. So makes sense where the where the location is it's it's sitting right behind her monitors just like mine does in, in my own house but we were running into some challenges where some of the cameras on the other end complete opposite end up one floor and and outside um, were having issues connecting back to the wireless and you know again it, it comes down to understanding of how these different things work and and also education you know I know from my experience having worked in wireless networking for uh, a number of years, that wireless is going to be impacted by things like distance and especially depending on the frequency um, other materials like wood and glass and metal are going to have a really major impact something like a five gigahertz signal is not going to penetrate really more than one room if there's wood or metal or glass in between the access point and the device that you're trying to connect it to and and two four is a little better but it, it's not perfect and so what we identified is that 
really the problem is the fact that the device that we're trying to connect to is on the other side of flashing. It's it's metal that's rebounding our signal. And so understanding that and being able to, you know, jump in and say, well, here, let's let's look at changing the way that the network is deployed instead of hardwiring, running a bunch of cables, spending a bunch of money. The you know solution is as simple as let's just upgrade, let's add another access point and and change that. But again, it, it kind of goes back to that understanding. You need to be educated and, and understand what are the variables here because there's nothing wrong with our network. You know, she's able, my mother-in-law is able to work every single day from her house. Everything else around their house works just fine. It's just this one camera. And so that level of education is really important because that's the difference between do I spend thousands of dollars hiring somebody to run cable versus do I just instead go and spend a couple of hundred bucks on some decent access points and, and deploy the network so that it covers more? Well, and I think that really goes into a point that we talk about a lot here is if you can isolate or identify uh, how to reduce the scope of that issue while you're troubleshooting, uh, part of that is the education piece of having to know, you know how to reduce the scope. But I think that that becomes a very important point when you look at monitoring or supporting work from home networks at scale, right? Yes. Yeah. IT does not have the resources to do the in-depth look that you did into your uh, mother-in-law's house, whereas I think IT is, is going to be in a position where they're asked to do that a few times. And so I think that gets back to if you can identify the scope or at least reduce it, then it's going to really help the meantime to resolution there. Yeah, not to plug too hard, but I think that's that's a core use case for the new wireless metrics and and the host metrics that have just come out with the AppNeta and Ten platform. You know, being able to give insight into if I am connected wirelessly or if I am connected wired, um, the difference in performance. You know, being able to see the difference in um, throughput through my access points versus capacity on the link, I think is a is a big differentiator that will help. And it just it adds the, uh, that extra tool to the toolbox when IT does need to troubleshoot those issues to be able to say, I can see that you're on wireless. I can see that this is the SSID that you're connected to. I can see the band that you're using. You know, and and we all know, especially as technology has evolved, devices are no longer using 802.11n as their standard. A lot of devices today use AC. And that requires a five gig connection. And again, five gig, it's, you know, it's much more sensitive to everything than to four. You certainly have a much wider, you know, band, uh, I should say bandwidth of connection channels and, and speeds, but you're still, you know, you're going to fall victim to lack of distance when you talk about, you know, five gigahertz performance. And so even just being able to see that and visualize that or see what else is on your network and what is the, you know, for example, airtime look like from your access points is going to be really critical to helping IT isolate and reduce that time. Even in some cases, you know, we have customers that are telling their users, we do not want you connected wirelessly. And so even just the basic being able to report back and say, I have these 15 users that are consistently connected wirelessly and be able to take action on that or, you know, negatively be able to not take action say listen i see that you're connected to wireless i need you to wire and then i'll help you troubleshoot the issue um those are sorts of things that it can now be empowered to do to help solve these issues without needing to go as in depth without needing to get you know a full network diagram as if that actually exists for a home network but um you know understand all of the the bits and pieces and yeah and it sounds like whether it's AppNeta customers, podcast hosts, or your mother-in-law. You are very busy these days, Joe. I don't envy you. Thanks again, Joe and Alec. And thank you listeners for joining us on Stories from the Wire, the AppNeta podcast. Subscribe to our feed to get the latest tips and tricks every week on how to manage network performance for the future of work. 